Welcome to Shield Maidens, Women of the Norse World, the podcast that celebrates the remarkable women of the Viking Age. From fierce warriors and powerful queens to wise seers and cunning goddesses, these women left an indelible mark on history. Join authors Johanna Wittenberg and K.S. Barton each month as we explore the stories, achievements, and impact of Norse women. Hello, and welcome to Shield Maidens, Women of the Norse World. I'm K.S. Barton, the author of the Norse Family Series, a Viking saga of love, revenge, sacrifice, and betrayal. And with me is author Johanna Wittenberg. Hi, Johanna. Hi, how are you doing, Kim? I'm good. Good. Well, we're finally getting spring here, and I'm very glad. Yes. Well, I'm Johanna Wittenberg. I'm the author of the Norse Women series, which is historical fiction set in the Viking Age, and it's based on the life of Queen Osa. She was a woman who ruled alone for 18 years in the ninth century. Wow, that's pretty impressive. 18 years ruling alone. A woman Especially in- at the beginning of the Viking Age, which was, you know, there were 30 warring countries in Norway, probably the most violent time in that country's history. And 18 years for a woman or a man would have been a really long time, as violent as it was and as dangerous as it was. And anything could have taken her out, even a simple cold. That's true. That's true. In fact, in my second to the last book, my fourth book, they do have a plague. So mm. <laughs> she survived it. And we actually even know why, which oh. is interesting. Very cool. Yes. So what are you working on right now? What are you, what's your writing life look like? Well, um, right now I'm in May, the May issue of uh, the Historical Times. I'll have an article on women's rights in the Dark Ages, which is interesting because women actually had far more rights in the Dark Ages than they did later in the medieval period or even the Tudor period. It's kind of an eye opener. Uh, The other thing I'm working on is book number six of the Norse Women series. And it mostly is, at this point, mostly concerns Osa, and she has an old enemy who comes back into her life. That's all I'll tell you. How about (laughs) you? What are you working on? I am, well, I just sent off my latest novel. It's called A Deal with Odin. Uh, I sent it off to the formatter. It's a historical fantasy um, of one woman's journey into the realm of Norse myth. So this was my first foray into historical fantasy. And I have to say it was a lot of fun to just be able to throw in, here's a God and here's, you know, and and so several of the Norse gods and goddesses make appearances along with some Valkyries. So that was a lot of fun for me to do. Oh, I can't wait to read it. That sounds (laughs) great. Hopefully it's with the formatter now. So hopefully it'll, it'll come out in the next month or so. Yeah. Excellent. Well, keep me posted. I will. Uh, and speaking of Valkyries, on our next episode, we will be talking about shield maidens from Norse mythology. And I'm sure Valkyries will most certainly be an important part of that conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. For this book, I, I did a bunch of research about Valkyries. And, and it's interesting how the stories of Valkyries have had changed you know there was like some kind of older stories that were a lot darker and grimmer than than what we think of now so yeah that was really kind of neat absolutely they really did change because they were just kind of these evil scary spirits that (laughs) yeah snatched men off the battlefield and they sort of transformed (laughs) yeah Yes. And in our previous episode, Johanna and I discussed shield maidens that were mentioned in the written sources. We discussed women like Hervor, Brynhildr, Lagertha, who some people might know from the TV show Vikings, along with a lot of other really interesting women who lived in that time period and were mentioned in the written sources. So if you haven't listened to it yet, check out that episode. It's episode one, shield maidens in the written sources. Was there anything that you had thought of in the meantime about that? I was just thinking, you know, is there anything you wanted to mention that you didn't get to in the first episode about the written sources? I think we really covered it all. Um, I think we also pointed out the fact that in some cases, the written sources are not very trustworthy, um, especially when it comes to the later Icelandic sagas. Women are, their portrayal is probably not accurate for something that happened 400 years before. Right. 
it's, it's, you know, when I think about that, that length of time and, you know, how far back we would go in, you know, American history, it would be before the, you know, the American revolution, if we didn't have any written records of what people were doing before that time. And it was just stories that were passed down from family to family or told before Kings and other nobles. It's kind of hard to believe that it would come down to us intact and truthful. <laughs> well, and they really, they did put quite a modern Christian and misogynistic gloss on it. Um, powerful women were generally evil. Whereas in Viking times, bold and powerful women were actually revered. So it's a little, little different slant on women in the sagas, as opposed to some of the earlier um, legends like Hervor, which was an early legend, and it wasn't wasn't changed too much except for the ending. In case you mm-hmm. notice, um, they all end up taking up needlepoint and getting married. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what they really did. Probably not. I would I would highly doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so in this month's episode, we want to talk about shield maidens who have been discovered by archaeologists. There are two very famous ones who maybe a lot of listeners have heard of, the female warrior from Birka in Sweden and also the Oseberg burial in Norway. I'd like to start with Birka because she she was most recently in news. I mean, I think it got out everywhere. I don't think it was just people studying medieval history or the Viking age who found out about her. There were a lot of headlines and clickbaity things, you know, about this female warrior who were who was discovered in in Birka. And there was quite a bit of controversy, which I think well, we're going to yeah. get into as well. Yes, we can get into that because I think that's a really important part of the conversation. Agreed. So in Birka, the burial site is known as BJ581, and it's an archaeological burial site located on the Swedish island of Björko, which is inland about an hour or two boat ride from Stockholm. I've actually been to Birka. It was a highlight of a of a trip I took to Sweden, and it was a beautiful ferry ride. And I think it lasted a couple of hours. And it was not, it didn't seem like it took two hours at all because it was just such a lovely trip. But anyway. (laughs) That's exciting that you got to see the place. Yeah. Yeah. I just kind of walked around looking at all the burial mounds thinking, wow, you know, and taking pictures. And yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty neat to kind of walk on that ground. No kidding. So the site was excavated in the late 19th century. I think it was 1878. And it's considered one of the most important Viking Age finds in Scandinavia, mostly because it had so many weapons in it. So like weapons aren't unusual in Viking graves, but Birka BJ581 had all the weapons, (laughs) plus two shields. So she had a sword, an axe, a fighting knife, two spearheads, and 25 armor-piercing arrows. There would have been a It was probably a bow as well, but since it would have been made out of wood, it was a thousand years, it it disintegrated. So, and then there were two shields. One was placed at the head and one was placed at the foot of the grave. There were other things as, as well. There were, she was buried with a gaming board and a full set of pieces. They were in a bag in her lap. And that's unusual too, to find like all the pieces and the board all intact And the gaming board and pieces imply that she was a military leader, probably, because like chess afterwards, these gaming boards and these games were, you know, part of strategy and learning strategy. And somebody buried with them was probably a military leader or strategist or something. Um, We had two horses that were buried with her as well. That's right. And that is a, a, a sign of high status and importance. Yes. Especially since it was the both of the the whole horses. Yes, know, not just their buried. head. Yeah, sometimes they're buried with just the head. So she was also buried near the Birka garrison. So Birka was a thriving, sophisticated metropolitan for the time. <laughs> for the time, yes. <laughs> Place. 
I don't know what, like a thousand people maybe were there. And, you know, a lot of people came and went with trading goods and warriors were set up there in the garrison. And she was, she was buried on a hillside near that, that garrison. And she was also buried sitting up facing out towards the water. Oh, she was also dressed in an elaborate caftan with silk decoration, another sign of high status. Anybody who had access to silk was rich. (laughs) Absolutely. So that's kind of like an overview of what she was buried with. And in the past, archaeologists sexed the skeletons that they would find based solely on the grave goods. So if a grave had weapons, that was a male grave. And if there were household items like spindles or whorls or looms, cauldrons, other cooking things, even like jewelry or or brooches that was just automatically considered female. And then that wasn't questioned for a very long time. <laughs> a very long time. <laughs> like a hundred years, a long time. Mm-hmm. That was not questioned. And nobody ever questioned that the warrior buried in Birka, BJ581, nobody ever questioned that this warrior was a man for a hundred years. They just assumed that since this person was buried on this hillside by this garrison with all the ceremony, all the weapons, the horses, you know, in those rich clothing, that it was, it was a male warrior. BJ581 was even called the ultimate Viking. Yeah, the ultimate Viking. I think it's very ultimate Viking. (laughs) (laughs) So that's what BJ581 was considered for a hundred years, right? It was just this ultimate male Viking. And fast forward a hundred years to the 1970s, and a researcher is cataloging the pieces of BJ581. Took a look at the pelvic bone. There was only one left, and went, "Wait a minute." I think this is a woman. So, but they still didn't have the ability to really tell until 2017 when they did genomic testing, DNA testing, and they proved that this person buried in Birka, this ultimate Viking was actually a woman. And so, yeah. And then all hell broke loose. (laughs) That's well put. (laughs) Yeah, because... If this was the ultimate Viking, what did that say? That this ultimate Viking was actually a woman. There was a lot of controversy. And they tried to make a lot of excuses for this. They tried to say that the bones got mixed up. Right. Or that there was another, there was probably another skeleton, a man's, and maybe it was her husband was buried there, but something had had happened to those bones. Uh, What was another one? Oh, that the weapons were just symbolic, that they were oh, right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was another one. <laughs> and all those theories have been disproven. Yes. I mean, people who are experts in swords and other weapons have said, no, these were functional weapons, especially the sword. They, I, I saw something about it where they were talking about how easily it would have been to use. It wasn't super fancy. It was a functional sword. So, and then the way the weapons and all of the the goods were oriented, they were all oriented around her. So there really yeah, wasn't even could... any space for another, if there was another skeleton, where would it have been? It wouldn't have been the most important person, even if it was in there. So yeah, like the the shields were, you know, at her head and at her feet. The sword was by her side. The gaming pieces were in her lap. The gaming board was next to her. There were two spears too, right? Yes. And they were next to her. So yeah, everything was oriented around her. So all these uh, theories that there was another skeleton or that it was for some other reason or she was misidentified, that just wrong. They were pretty lame. Yeah, they were reaching, (laughs) reaching. But also she was quite tall for a woman of that Mm -hmm. time period. As Mm -hmm. I understand it, she was as tall as a man. Yeah. Five foot seven. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I read too. And that, what was a five foot six, five foot seven was about average for a Viking man. Yes. And women were quite, you know, normally quite a bit smaller. So she Mm -hmm. was pretty, pretty big woman for that time period. And she was, I believe I remember reading she was in her 30s when she died. 
and she was from southern Scandinavia. Could have been Denmark, could have been South Norway or southern Sweden even, but she had traveled a lot in her lifetime, in her fairly short lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. And her dress indicated that maybe she'd been in the east, maybe down in what is now Russia, Ukraine, that area, because the 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 caftan that she was wearing looked like that. She had one of those hats, I can't remember what they're called, that were tipped at the top. That had a it con- they were conical, coat. yeah, uh-huh. and that was typical of of the Rus, the the Vikings who settled in in what's now Russia and Ukraine. So, yeah, she must have traveled a lot. Fascinating, Absolutely I know, fascinating. So, I wanted to include a a quote that Viking scholar and archaeologist Neil Price said in an interview. This was with the Secrets of the Dead when they were discussing BJ five eight one, and he said. Nobody had any problem at all about the warrior interpretation of this burial all the while this person was male. And suddenly, lots of people have a problem with the warrior part the moment this person is female. And that doesn't add up. Very well put. Yes, (laughs) it doesn't add up indeed. It just shows our cultural bias that this person we considered the ultimate Viking as long as it was male. But now, as soon as it's female, it's not, you know, they're not. It doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. Why can't it just, she just be a female warrior, a leader. She wasn't just a warrior. She was a leader. You know, she was a military leader. She was really important in Birka or somewhere to be buried right there by the garrison on the hillside, overlooking as as if she was a, still a century even a century s e n t r y <laughs> even after she was dead yeah. and that was something that was fairly common in the viking age as well that they did bury people in places where they were were needed well plus most people were cremated right i mean you know i mean yes. there are a lot of burials on birka lots of mounds, but still usually only really important people got a burial mound and and a burial mound with the grave goods that she was buried with. You were a very important person. Absolutely. Another thing I noticed on that, that special was that um, the stones would designate whether someone, the shape of the stone designated whether someone was male or female, but her stone gravestone had been, um, exploded because oh, they right. couldn't they couldn't excavate underneath it and the archaeologists did not leave a conclusive drawing so that was another mystery we didn't know what kind of stone was on her grave that's right yeah because one shape was meant female and one meant male and they didn't yes. know i believe but didn't... female was oval if i remember right right yeah and didn't they say it was eight feet across it was huge it was just <laughs> enormous yeah. Um, they wanted her to stay put. Yeah. And they wanted people to see that there is this burial mound there. It yeah. was a monument. Yes. yes. Yes, exactly. One thing I would love to see in Sweden are all the, the stone ship circles. Yes. I want to go back at some point and see the stone ship circles because all those stones that somebody had set up to make them look like Viking longships. I just think that's so fascinating. Apparently they have them in uh, northern uh, Denmark too. Okay. Yeah. Which I just found out recently when I was researching my latest book, which is partly going to take place in Denmark. Nice. Yeah. So they didn't just haphazardly put these stones up. There was a reason and a purpose, especially one as big as if if, if it was eight feet across. How did they even do it? Yeah. That's, that's a lot of work and you have to mean it when you do yep. that. So this person, this woman... <laughs> was was somebody somebody very formidable and i'll have they, to be they said on the tv show that they did not want to meet her in real life right <laughs> she'd be scary <laughs> maybe from afar <laughs> yeah <laughs> a fly on the wall <laughs> right yes yeah i bet she was pretty ruthless no but doubt. still i have to admit that it kind of makes me angry as a <laughs> you know as a modern woman that they would have taken all this time and I don't know, attention and done all this stuff to bury her in this way. 
And then all of us are like, oh, well, she couldn't be a woman, you know, just to dismiss it, you know, not all of us, but many people just dismissing that she was a woman, you know, it's almost like it's uh, disrespecting her memory and all that they did to, to, to memorialize her. We haven't really come very far since medieval times. And when I was when I was uh, researching my article on women's rights in the dark ages, it made me even angrier. Yeah. yeah. Centuries went by after that, you know, after the Norman, the Norman conquest is really kind of the tip of the iceberg. That's when things really changed a lot. Anyway, yeah. that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything to add about BJ581? No, I think we covered her pretty well, but she was, had to have been an amazing woman. Mm -hmm. But she's not the only warrior. She is not. (laughs) There is another one that was discovered in 1900 in Solor, Norway. It was the grave of a young woman. She was aged about 18 or 19 years old. It was excavated in 1900. And she was buried with her head resting on a shield. The skeleton of her horse was at her feet. And her grave contained a full set of weapons. And a full set of weapons is very rare. So she had a sword, a spear, a battle axe, and arrows. Very much like BJ 581. Even though she was buried with a full set of weapons, even in 1900, they recognized that she was a woman. I'm not sure why, maybe more, I think more of her skeleton, including her skull, was available. And she was um, celebrated as the first evidence of a shield maiden. This woman died around the year 900. She died after a sword blow to her forehead. But that injury didn't kill her, at least not right away. She died, it had actually begun to heal before she died. Now, whether she lay in a coma for a while and then finally succumbed, That seems very likely, but we don't know for sure. But in 2019, the University of Dundee in Scotland used facial reconstruction technology to show us her face. And I think you may remember it was quite widely broadcast on the Internet. First, they did a picture of her with the injury, which was quite drastic. Uh, The the skull? Yeah, yeah, right in the middle of her forehead. It was a big sword blow. Uh, And then uh, they also did a reconstruction that showed her without the injury, which was nice. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, it's very, very strange to see a person like that, you know, you know, more than a thousand years later. Now, I think I remember you telling me, uh, Kim, that she was only five feet tall. Yeah, Yeah, she was. She was tiny. So that was more of a normal size for a Mm -hmm. woman in that time period. Five foot, five foot one, five foot two. Uh, but she was still a warrior. That's because yeah. you don't get buried with a full set of weapons uh, if you are just a victim. Right. Yeah. She would have just been thrown in a grave somewhere. And wasn't yeah. she also buried on a on a hillside in a prominent position? Yes, she was. Yeah. I remember seeing images of the, the skull that had the big old dent. In yeah. <laughs> like, oh, my God. Geez, how did she survive that? Well, maybe she didn't. But she really didn't. I think it, she was. I'm sure she must have had, you know, a severe concussion and bleeding on the brain. And sometimes you do linger for a while after that, but it's rare to survive an injury like that. Yeah. And even if she had, who knows what she, what her life would have been like, you know, a massive head injury oh, is, can be life-changing Yeah, in a bad way. Yes. But yeah, it's one thing that I think, I think people are starting to get better is, is showing some of these, um, fights between Viking warriors where they're actually doing things. Like I know she got hit in the head with a sword, but you know, like using like your shield as an actual weapon, you know, to, to hit somebody in the head or to grab hold of somebody's sword and yank it away or doing things like that. And I think that's, that's, it's not just like two swords constantly meeting or whatever. And and so I like that some of the more modern Viking shows actually show them using their shields as a way to take somebody out as, as an actual weapon and not just a defensive. I, I, I was thinking reading, about that. I remember reading somewhere that it was considered really bad form to clash steel on steel because, you know, you nicked your weapon and right. now, you tried not to do that. And so, it, you know, that was something that young fighters were trained not to do if they could 
avoid it. Of course, you couldn't always avoid it, but you know, your shield was a major weapon, that iron boss Mm -hmm. that covered your fist. And then it had an iron rim around it usually as well. And so that made it quite a formidable weapon. Yeah. I mean, you could, you could rush somebody and push them over. You could hit them. Yeah. Either with the edge of the shield or the boss and you could, you could kill somebody easily with that iron boss. Yeah. And and not that many people, I mean, swords were so expensive that they were very rare. You wouldn't want to risk it. people had an ax. Yes. An ax and a spear. And in fact, in the shield wall, the spear was the weapon of choice because of its reach. Right. It would have been really handy if you were fighting against somebody who was, you know, maybe like a a Frank or somebody from France who was maybe mounted a a spear would have been very handy. (laughs) Yes, especially since the Vikings did fight on foot. They did not fight from horseback until much later. Well, I know the Vikings did avoid clashes with the Franks, except when they invaded Paris and they were very successful there. They were formidable. The Franks were a very formidable war group. Yeah. Well, they'd been fighting for such a long time. It's funny, though. I I, I think of when they sieged Paris and and even when they went over to England constantly, like every summer. I just imagine them thinking of some of these places like giant piggy banks or, you know, like, (laughs) well, we could use a little more silver. So let's go over to England. (laughs) Let's go shake the silver tree. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And they really did for a time. The Vikings had pretty much all of Europe intimidated. Yeah. Shaking in their boots. Yep. Can't blame them. No. No. Well, and that's why I think Vikings also are misunderstood is because everything that's or most everything that's been written down in the time period was written by their enemies, was written by priests who were terrified of them or, or you know, written by some scribe of the king who had to pay them off like in hundreds of pounds of silver, you know, so. There's yeah, they could reason. change history to read any way they wanted. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's, and they did. They did that quite regularly. Yes, especially with women. Yes. Well, so another, speaking of women, yes. <laughs> let's go, let's move on to Oseberg. Okay, so another burial, which is not a weapon containing burial, or at least no weapons were found in it, uh, except an axe, which was a household axe. This is the Oseberg burial. It was excavated in 1904. So a farmer dug into a burial mound on his property in Vestfold, Norway, which is south of Oslo, uh, and he turned up some carved pieces of wood. Well, he was kind of looking for a Viking ship because another one had been excavated earlier in the 1800s, not too far away. So he had his suspicions. And when he turned up these pieces of carved wood, he knew he'd found something really important. So he took him to the archaeologist Gabriel Gustafsson. Uh, and the following year, 1904, Gustafsson led a team of archaeologists who excavated the Oseberg Mound. They uncovered a 70-foot Viking longship loaded with artifacts. It had sleighs and beds and chests. It had a ceremonial cart, a chair, which was quite rare, a loom, and all kinds of household equipment. Uh, Even food, there were apples and berries um, that were sent with the dad, and there was a a butchered ox, (laughs) so in case they got hungry. That's where the axe was found. And there were animals. This ship, they executed many, many animals and threw their carcasses on the ship. Dogs, horses, oxen. So it's perhaps the greatest burial ship ever found in Norway. And it's one of the most important discoveries that show us how people lived in the Viking Age. The sleek, elaborately carved ship was built in western Norway around the year 820, out of oak mostly, the hull is all oak, and some pine. Uh, The timbers of the burial chamber were felled in the year 834. So the burial took place sometime after that date. And for the funeral rites, this ship had been dragged up a stream and tied off to a huge boulder So it couldn't go anywhere. So we see this theme of boulders on graves, Mm -hmm. holding the people in place one way or the other. There's evidence that the ceremony, the burial ceremony may have last several weeks, maybe even several months, possibly all summer. Hmm. And the burial contains the remains of two women. 
There's no evidence of any man. One of the women was around 70 to 80 years old. She was ancient by the standards of her time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, She was crippled. She suffered from cancer. They think she might have died from cancer. And the younger woman was about 50 years old. She had fractured her collarbone some weeks before her death, but it had begun to heal. So we have no idea who they are for sure. Were they related to each other? Was one woman a sacrifice buried with her mistress? Remnants of the clothing of both of these women and analysis of their health and diet confirmed that they were both very high status people. The older woman was apparently wearing a red dress that was in a very fine weave. The younger woman wore a blue dress that was also a fine weave, but maybe not quite the same same ilk as the other. So one really important, but until recently pretty much ignored element of the burial are the Oseberg tapestries. So they were kind of shunted aside and ignored for many years simply because they were women's work and they weren't considered very important. But they are very important. They are pictorial weavings that show us people and rituals that we have seen nowhere else, not even on the rune stones, nowhere. There are scenes in which both men and women appear wearing animal costumes. And this is reminiscent of the tales of berserkers and shapeshifter. One scene is comprised only of women, armed women. They're dressed as boars. They're dressed as birds. There's one. There's a woman dressed as a moose, we think. And there is a row of eight shield maiden, maidens bearing swords and shields. So it's a squadron of shield maidens. Nice. There's another scene that shows both men and women dressed for ritual and for battle. Two men are shown, and you can tell men from women because the women have long skirts and the men are wearing pants. But there are every bit as many women in these weavings as there are men. So the men are, there's two men in a bear costumes, and there's a man in another kind of costume that's very hard to make out. Uh, and then behind them is another squadron of shield maidens. We can identify at least six women in the background wearing long skirts and holding shields. There's other women who seem to be performing rituals. There's a tree from which nine men are hung. uh, And there are women surrounding this tree that look like they may be sorceresses or priestesses. This tree is very reminiscent of the description from the 10th century that Adam of Bremen described a ritual at the temple of Gamla Uppsala in Sweden. Gamla Uppsala means old Uppsala in Sweden. And this is where um, they held their sacrifices every nine years. And they hung nine males of every species from these trees. So two of the fragments show a procession of men and women riding, walking, and driving carts. So we wonder, are these the scenes of the burial procession of the Oseberg ship? It could be. Um, Or are they historical or mythological events? We just don't know. But many people believe this is the grave of Queen Osa. The burial would have occurred during her lifetime, for sure. And it's also in very close proximity to her kingdom of Agder. So it's in Vestfold, but it's in southern Vestfold. And her son, Halfdan the Black, had claimed half of Vestfold when he came of age. So this very well could have been Osa's son burying her, burying his mother with great honor, just right on the border in between Vestfold and Agder. Whoever it was, this was the grave of at least one and very possibly two very powerful women in the Viking Age. So there were no weapons in this grave, and there was really no jewelry either. Uh, Yeah, that's interesting. The grave had been looted about 100 years later. They don't really know why or who looted it, but it had been dug into, and it wasn't like somebody in the dead of night. It would have taken a week to dig in here. They had dragged even parts of the skeletons into the the tunnel that they dug in. 
Uh, so the grave was pretty messed up. And these tapestries were all caked together. Mm. Of course, it had been in the grave for over a thousand years. So, uh, But they, the archaeologists very carefully soaked them apart. And this a woman named Sophie Kraft spent a lot of time drawing them in mm. great detail before they disintegrated. Uh, and another woman named Mary Storm also did some very detailed drawings. And then they were kind of just put away in the museum and forgotten until archaeologist named Marianne Videller from the University of Oslo. She became very interested and she's written a, several books and done several television specials uh, about these weavings. So I'm glad there's a specialist who's looking into them. because They have a lot to tell us. Yeah. And it's amazing to me that they would have just been pushed aside as if they were unimportant, considering how much work and time goes into a tapestry like that, you know, with all those details, with all the different people, you know, the women in this and then the shapeshifters and, you know, well, or the people with the bear, you know, on them, just the amount of work and time and and money that would have been required to create those tapestries and the fact that they were included in the burial means that they were important and what, and you know, I, I get why they were pushed aside. Like, well, this is just women's stuff, but a tapestry was no simple thing. It's not like now where we can just, you know, create something on a computer that takes 10 minutes, you know, that would have taken months, maybe years to create maybe something years. like that. Mm -hmm. It is Probably it's right up there with the Bayou Tapestry as far mm -hmm. as the things we can learn from it. What's really strange is that the Bayou Tapestry has been studied a great deal and it has really influenced what we know about Vikings because Harold Hardrada was a Viking mm -hmm. and so was William the Conqueror. He was a Norman uh, and so he was descended from Rolf the um, or Rollo, the first Viking in Normandy. So we've studied that. They have Viking ships in it. They have weaponry. They have how they ate. And yet here we have had this Oseberg tapestry all these years that give us the same kind of thing. And they haven't been studied. Yeah. So, partly it was their condition. They, I will admit they were in quite bad condition. And we've only been able to apparently salvage a very small fragment of them. Oh, that's too bad. At it least is. they got to salvage some of them. At least it didn't completely disappear over the years. Absolutely. Yeah, the centuries. Uh, so I also, the the fact that these women, you know, like you said, because of their diet, we can see that they were high status, that they were wearing colorful clothes. And, you know, I, it's something that I wanted to do in my books. And I, well, I did do in my books that showed people of wealth using color. Like we like to think of the middle ages as just so dark and bleak and everybody's wearing brown and, <laughs> but it's like, yeah, but rich people didn't do that. You know, rich people, especially Vikings, it's those Viking men, they were dandies. They if, were. They, if they had the wealth, they were wearing red and blue and, you know, they would paint their houses and they would paint their stuff. And, you know, just because, you know, it's been so long, so many hundreds of years, you know, the any remains that we have are either stone or the paint would have all been gone. It's kind of like looking at like some of the, the Roman and Greek ruins, you know, we look at them and they're just these white temples. Well, they would have had mosaics. They would have been colorful. They would have been beautiful too, especially on the inside. And it's the same thing, you know, the people who had money, there wasn't, you know, they, they showed it. They, they wore their jewelry. They, you know, there's women, these high status women with their necklaces that they wore that had glass beads and silver and just elaborate necklaces, you know, three or four strings of them on their person. And so that was one thing I'd like to do. One of my characters, he loved to wear blue and he painted his house and, you know, he was kind of a dandy, but, you know, <laughs> but he was also a pretty fierce warrior. My characters who have, who had wealth, wore colors, lots of colors. And they have found traces of paint on these ships and also on the rune stones. Of course, it's all worn away, but there's right. these little fragments in the grooves of paint. So they know they were all very brightly painted. 
Yeah. And the shields would have been painted. And I'd, I'd forgotten about the runes, some of the rune stones being painted. Yeah. I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, reconstructions of them where they showed how brightly colored they were. Mm. Yeah. So I, I, I'm glad that we're kind of getting away from this, this image of the middle ages as everything was brown. Yeah, because it really was not. But what we have left of them was right. Every, it's yeah. pretty brown, and uh, I'm sure know. really poor people. They really, you know, they couldn't afford the dyes. Or, but even then, a lot of the dyes were natural products. You know that you could forage. And yeah, there were some that were very that were kind of rare. Like there's one that comes from a a mollusk in Ireland and in Scotland that was purple and that was reserved. Mm. That's where that whole thing about purple was reserved for the Kings that started out with the Pictish went on, but that was such a difficult dye to get because you had to really, uh, I believe boil down mm. these mollusks. And I think it came from their shells. If I remember oh, right. Gosh, Very interesting. Yeah. 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 And of course, like the Oseberg tapestries, they're brown now. They're brown sure. and gray. All the colors have faded, except there's a little red. Some of, There's a red that's quite persistent. But they, so uh, with Marianne Videller in her book, the latest book, which is called the Oseberg tapestries, she has had an artist who has reconstructed the colors. They don't know for sure what the colors were, but he gave an artist rendering of these tapestries as very colorful and they're quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. They really are lots of red and blue and mm -hmm. yellow. But they were natural dyes. However, the dyeing process was a big deal too. It wasn't easy. I went in my first book, I go through the whole thing of linen harvest mm. and stretching and redding and dyeing and oh my gosh it just goes on and on so yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> that was actually one of the reasons why the main female character in my book my trilogy is kind of a high status young woman so she didn't have to do as much of the spinning and dyeing and all that that there were people who did that for her she was she was able to do more of the higher level like embroidery and work on you know tapestries and things like that i was like <laughs> oh i didn't want to have a character who was just trapped to the spindle and whirl or a loom you know like she could she constantly always had one in her hands i was like oh i need to do something else <laughs> i made her a little higher status <laughs> so, and my main character is not very good at it and of course uh, my <laughs> secondary character ron guild uh, no one would ever think of asking her to do such oh that's thing. funny <laughs> right yeah <laughs> And that's funny because I, I I think, you know, some people might be like, oh, that wouldn't be realistic, but, you know, because women would, would just do that. But it's like, you know what, there were women and other people who didn't fit the mold, who pushed back against all the boundaries and societal mores, just like there are now. Well, and especially in the Viking age, you know, the thing that people have to remember is that if you were bold, you could get away with it. Right. Children, men and boys and girls were both trained in the martial arts when they were children. They grew up fighting. They grew up sailing. They grew up swimming. They were very athletic and outdoorsy. They grew up skiing. You know, the the I, I think for a lot of them, the spinning might have just been kind of a... <laughs> <laughs> a good reason to get inside and warm up. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to say, but you know, they were a very they were not women were not constrained the right. way they were in the Middle Ages. The early medieval period and the Dark Ages, women were not constrained in any northern European society, including England and Ireland. Yeah. Only France had the constraints. Yeah. yeah. And even then, um, even the women who took care of the household and did the gardening and raised children, they were still respected for that. A, a woman who was good at those things, she was, she was respected. It wasn't like that was some kind of a second class citizen kind of thing. Yes. We have one more queen we would like to talk about. Yes. And speaking of women's rights, this <laughs> woman is definitely one. It's not just one woman. So originally there was an excavation called the Gausel Queen, and she was in Rogaland, which is on the west coast of Norway, but it's, it's in this, it's, uh, Gausel is now a suburb of Stavanger. So it's on, it's on the inboard side on the Gandafjord, not on the actual coast of the Atlantic. 
Uh, and this is the home of the Gauzel Queen. She's the most famous one. I've based my character, Rangild, on this burial. But Gauzel is an ancient farmstead. It's been continuously occupied since before Roman times. Wow. Uh, yeah. It was very likely the most important steading in the area during the Viking Age. And uh, there's many, many high-status burials placed over ancient ruins. Uh, and there are several ship graves and boat burials. These graves contain the highest concentration of Irish metal objects in the world. So we know that they had a lot of contact with Ireland. And mm -hmm. my, main, my character, Rangil, does have a lot of contact with Ireland. Archaeologists believe these burials were part of establishing the inheritance rights to the land, to the property. Mm -hmm. So according to archaeologist Barbara Dahl, in Gozo, high-status female burials appear to be twice as common as male burials. Now, the soil here does not preserve bone pretty much at all. We just don't have any bones from the Viking Age there. So all the graves have been assigned their gender based on grave goods rather than DNA or osteological evidence. But when they go over this, you know, uh, most of Scandinavia there are many more male graves, but in this area, the female graves are very dominant. All of this suggests that during Viking times, the women owned the land and they very likely ruled there. So it was uh, matriarchal to some degree. Uh, later on, once we get into the early medieval period, like uh, around 1200, the medieval laws of Rogaland seriously restrict a woman's rights to inherit land. But this is long after it was Christianized. Mm -hmm. So grave number 1883 is known as the Gausel Queens, and it's one of the richest graves in Norway, almost as rich as that of the Oseberg burial mm -hmm. ship. The Gausel Queen burial is dated around 850 AD, so just a little bit later than the Oseberg, 15 years, 20 years later. And the occupant was buried, it was, you know, we assume it was a woman because of the jewelry. She was buried in a wooden coffin with female grave goods, but she also had, her horse's head was buried with her. It had the finest harness with 13 gilded bronze mounts in the Irish style. And she also had the finest gilded bronze brooches. You know, they wore the pair of brooches known from this period along with an elaborate massive silver brooch, two silver arm rings, three drinking horns with Irish mounts, more gilded bronze mounts, an Irish hanging bowl, glass beads, a ring of jet, a casket, rivets, knives, and various utensils. So she had a lot hmm. buried with her. And the grave was located along the aisle of a pre-Roman smithy, so an ancient smithy. And it was the grave was situated between the outer wall and the forge. So this, com this placement is considered high status, referring to the ancestry of the deceased. And it's likely to establish inheritance rights to this property. There's three boat graves in the area, and they also contain horses' heads with harnesses. But no human bones have survived, so these burials have been designated as male since they contain full sets of weapons. Now, that doesn't mean that they are men. <laughs> right. That there's no bones at all. The largest of them contained a full set of blacksmith tools in a boat. The boat's completely disintegrated. It's estimated the boat was about 30 feet long and dated about the same time as the Gausel Queen. So as you mentioned um, in your first talk about BJ581, you know, until very recently, Viking grave finds have been designated as male or female based on the grave goods. And a lot of the reason for that is that there weren't any bones or the very bones were not in very good condition. It has resulted in a belief that well over half the burials in Viking age Scandinavia were male. But this belief is coming into question since the occupants of BJ581 and some other graves have proven to be female based on the DNA and the osteological evidence. So we've got to be much more careful than mm -hmm. we have been in the past. Um, this really is very telling. 
Yeah, it really is. And I, I guess I said in, in Birka too, that the, the soil was not good for, you know, re- there was a lot of skeletons that weren't very in good condition. Even BJ581, there was a lot missing. I guess they had just enough to to figure out that that she was female. But yeah, I think she calls into question all of it, you know, that we can't just assume that just because the grave goods are weapons, that it's a man. No, exactly. So did they know if the Gausel Queen, was she actually from Norway, do they think? Or was she from Ireland? They or? have no bones. She I guess if there's no Ireland. bones, they have no way of knowing. That's yeah, inter- That'd be interesting to see if she's actually from Ireland and ended up in Norway, or if she was Norwegian and just was over in Ireland a lot, trading and raiding and doing whatever Vikings do. Well, in my, in my third book, which is The Raider Bride, it kind of gives one story that might be might have occurred so okay <laughs> so go out and buy johanna's books so you can find out <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> it's been an awful lot of fun uh researching women's rights in ireland as well because Oof, they yeah. had a lot more rights back in the early medieval times during the Viking they? age. Yes. They and they've did. been Christian for a very long time. Long they had been Christian since around, well, St. Patrick was, I think, of the year 450. Yeah. But interestingly, you know, they had um, St. Bridget, Bridget of right. Kildare. She is one of three main Christian saints of Ireland. The other two are men, Conkill and uh, St. Patrick, but Bridget, was around the year 526 and she was she had her own her own religious colony that mm-hmm. she developed and she had dual houses both male and female living under her rule i didn't know that yes That's and at the same time so this is celtic christianity right a lot different than roman catholic true so that was when, once they adopted the Roman Catholicism, that's when women's rights really kind of came to a to an end. Well, that is very interesting. We have two other burials that we will get into in a, in a future episode when we are going to discuss seeresses, sorceresses, vulvas. One yeah. of my favorite subjects. I know. It's very exciting. The grave goods in those indicate that... Or, or not necessarily the grave goods, grave goods, and or the way the women were buried indicates that maybe <laughs> something was going on. <laughs> yes, something indeed. So we will save those for another time. Is there anything else you wanted to mention? Anything we haven't covered? No, I think we kind of covered it all. Now your yeah. next book will be coming out sometime in May, right? Yes, yes. And you'll be it, announcing it on your website yeah, and to my newsletter and, and all that good stuff. Wonderful. Okay. And we are good for now. Yes. And next time we will be discussing shield maidens from Norse mythology. That'll be fun. I love mythology. So <laughs> I'm <laughs> Me looking too. forward to that too. So, all right. Thank you, Johanna. Nice to see you, you Kim. You too. Take Bye-bye. care. Bye. Thank you for listening. You can find Johanna at www.johannawittenberg.com. That's J-O-H-A-N-N-A-W-I-T-T-E-N-B-E-R-G.com. And sign up for her newsletter to receive a free short story, a prequel to the Norse Queen series. And you can find me, K.S. Barton, at www.ksbarton.com. That's B-A-R-T-O-N.com where you can sign up for my mailing list to receive a free short story by Their Wits, a prequel story to my Norse family series. See you next time.